Okay. So, Art, one of the terms that's come up uh, recently is an era of digital intelligence. Now, I'm not sure this is actually intelligence, but it's certainly doing more than a very fixed function type of response, of what, which is what we've done with technology in the past. So what does this mean for both semiconductors and for software, which are now part of the same system? And they always have been, but they've always been developed more separately than, in, than they do today. So that, that's as open-ended the question as any, right? So I can of take course. it anywhere. Anywhere. And uh, you know, if we zoom straight into the business that we are in, it's of course of massive importance because it's actually on one hand a continuation and on the other hand a substantial discontinuity. Let me explain. If I look at the semiconductor history, uh, you can sort of see three phases. First phase, clearly computation. The PC was the killer app, and the PC was this platform that enabled something else called software that you could put on top. And it enabled an enormous number of people and, and companies to be successful. And then in the, in the 2000s, we saw a repeat of that in mobility, which through the smartphone as the killer app uh, was a platform and you could put something on top of it, it was called apps, not software, but it's really the same, except that apps is well chosen because it sort of alludes to the end result of what you're gonna get. And of course, computation went through uh, you know, networking and cloud and internet and so on. And uh, the mobility leveraged off of all of those things and added one more thing, which is super low power technology. So the first one drove uh, performance, the second one drove uh, super low power. Meanwhile, in the 90s, there was quite a bit of excitement about AI. And I forget when it was, like 97 or so, that uh, you know, the, the chess champion, uh, you know, I think he's still in psychotherapy right now, got beaten by a machine. <laughs> but it was actually an indication of things to happen. And you may remember at that time, people said, yeah, but chess, such an easy game. Your strategy, follow, follow the, the, the move, whereas go, it will never be beaten. And of course, uh, was it last year that um, Go was Google. finally cracked. Google uh, cracked it with a really different approach. As you said, a nonlinear form of, of uh, programming. Uh, and ultimately, that was the beginning of seeing very clearly that uh, uh, intelligence in some form, as some reasoning or predictive ability, uh, was starting to actually have some results. And of course, we've seen many, many other fields. And so you say, so what is different between that phase and this phase? Well, for starters, things that's not different is that we've seen this continued exponential, not only in semiconductors, but more importantly in the, uh, the delivered functionality continue at an unbelievable speed. And there's no discontinuity there. It's actually a continuous space, except that at some point in time, suddenly computation is sufficient to do something. And the sufficient was to use the very techniques that were mostly pioneered in the 80s and 90s in artificial intelligence but had a relatively little impact, and suddenly computation is sufficient for some of those, such as machine learning. And with that breakthrough, now you get a discontinuity in domains of applicability. And that is really what, what we're seeing right now is continuation of what we together have done for quite a number of years, and suddenly techniques that in the past were impossible now are starting to get results. Well, similar to what the PC and the, the, uh, the smartphone did, once you have something that works, what do you want? Something that works better, like a lot better. And therein lies, of course, the challenge here because what uh, digital intelligence requires to really be cool is another 10, 100,000 X in computation. And there are a lot of implications to that. But that is sort of the way I, I, I look at this, this position that we're in which is fabulous because, again, we are at the center of gravity of enabling a wave that will change you know, the way, in many ways, mankind functions. And what we're doing is taking things in a different direction, which is that we don't necessarily have one processor that will be used in all these devices, right? Now we have a system that is com basically customized, still has to do the, the massive processing, still has this massive amount of data flowing through it, but it's customized for this one specific use. Well, I think you're putting your finger on exactly the opportunity going forward. You know, I mean, multiprocessors, multithreading are not new in our field, but what I think is interesting is that we're coming from an age where a fairly general platform enables an enormous amount of applications and software. Now I think it's gonna be the opposite, which is certain types of algorithms 
would really like to have a thousand x more computation. There's no way you're going to get there with just semiconductor advances. Semiconductor will continue to advance, and it's actually quite amazing what we're, what we're seeing in terms of new transistor types, sizes, and so on. Oh, the record button was not on. Yeah. We'll, we'll get the rest of it. Uh, machine learning would have fixed that. But uh, the. Uh, <laughs> You're calling me a machine? <laughs> we will be replaced at some point in time. Me before you. But uh, in any case, uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity space here is interesting because. You can see the race for new algorithms, and you can see the race for new architectures to support these algorithms. And if the, if, if the potential of one of those is broad enough, there's no reason that people will not uh, create dedicated uh, chips for a specific application. And that, of course, is, is, is mana from heaven for our industry, because that means a lot of design. That needs optimizing for new characteristics again. And you know, that's what this audience is best at. So who gets left behind and who wins out of this? Left behind is only if, if you're not seeing the natural evolution. This industry will not be left behind. We're in the midst of this. We understand this. This is our bread and butter. And, and many people uh, in the audience in our industry have seen this coming for a long time. The challenge is always you can see strategy and directions fairly easily. Pinpointing the time where something matters is actually quite difficult, right? It's and now the, we see the it's, inflection. It's, the, it's not the month, it's the year, right? Yeah, or sometimes the decade, but <laughs> you know, uh, the fact is that, that uh, the end applications is where the money comes from. A and what is remarkable uh, outside of what we just discussed is that uh, amended by some other things such as IoT, uh, a lot of industries have figured out that their business, their products, their business models could be impacted by a different utilization of the data that is somehow attached to their devices or their, uh, their business model. And if you can harness that in a way that uh, finds shortcuts, uh, efficiencies, or just completely different ways of going about business, that's high impact. And we're starting to see that with companies like Amazon, um, even IBM, uh, Google, where they're starting to develop their own architecture specifically for mm -hmm. Harnessing that data, right? They want to process this thing, this stuff, very fast, but it's their type of data. So Facebook would be different than what a Google search does. Yeah, and so you see all the people that are in the processor world trying to listen very, very carefully to what will be the needs or trying to predict themselves what the needs are, or even one step further, trying to be on the path of the data so that they are closer to where the money ultimately is made. So what is, where does EDA fit in? What does EDA become or need to become in order to facilitate this? Well, so uh, if you take traditional EDA, you would say EDA has been the other half of Moore's Law. You know, and um, unbelievably uh, top credit goes to uh, the, the technology and manufacturing people because they have driven down physics in ways that over and over have been described as impossible, right? I mean, it's sort of a every seven year cycle that Moore's Law is dead. And you know, it's, it's sort of still very much there, except that it's morphed. I think Moore's Law is less now just hardcore Denard scaling. It is uh, exponential delivery of, of functionality and performance. That has continued, absolutely. And so as that continues, our, our industry has evolved to become more oriented towards the systems, to understand more about the, the, the relationship between uh, software architectures and implementations while still driving down into the physics like there's no tomorrow. And you know, speaking for a minute just about synopsis, there's a reason why a few years ago we changed our tagline under the, the, the logo to silicon to software, but it could have also been said physics to function. Same thing, one is more techno nerd than the other, I guess. Uh, but, but, it, but it is a continuum. And the very fact that this continuum now suddenly is clicking in because the intersection between software and hardware is materially relevant is, should be very encouraging because we're as well trained as anybody as an industry to be part of that. So what's missing out of that? I mean, we, we've been following this flow for a very long time and we've, we've become very good at shrinking chips and, and solving all the power issues that, and the physical effects that, that crop up at these. What do we need to do in the future in order to achieve this vision that we're talking about? Well, one of, of the interesting things is that as we move closer to the, the domains of application, one also, gets closer to different uh, segment verticals. Right. 
right? And so, so dealing with automotive is different than with computation and mobility or health or energy and so on. Each, each profession has its own language, its own need, its own time constant and so on. And, and so you can now suddenly see a number of, of system companies becoming very interested in this space because that's their natural home. You can also see a number of those companies, such as car companies, which are really sophisticated systems, being potentially massively disrupted if the, the electronics part, the, the, uh, the machine learning, the data part, suddenly impacts their business model opportunities. And so all these people are simultaneously looking at, so what should we do and who should we work with? And again, I think our industry is well placed to at least be a layer of, uh, of the solution to those questions and engage with those. But there's a lot of learning because whenever you have a disruption, actually I think it's, it's true for any thinking process, the first phase of the thinking process is always an opening process and then you get your closure and it sort of works but not quite and then you reopen. And so that first phase feels very much like chaos, right? And so what we're talking now is systemic chaos that's being reined in and some people already see you know, a great opportunity at the end, sort of the, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It may be just shiny metal right now, but, but there will be a number of pot of golds there. And I think that movement has fully started. And this is what's going on in a lot of these industries right now. I think about automotive, for example. Um, who owns the car in the future? Is it the car companies? Is it the guys doing the infotainment system? Or, or um, is it Google? Is it Apple? Um, is it some service that potentially runs all this stuff and, do, and does it differently than what we're doing? All this stuff plays back, but are you better at controlling that historically from the bottom or from the top? Well, you know, it, it's sort of uh, fun to watch how the messaging has accelerated really far into broad applications. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I happened to be with uh, you know, the, the mayor of San Jose, and this is part of you know, a number of executives talking about what do we do with the city, with traffic, and God knows what. And of course, they're already dreaming about, well, should we have autonomous driving lanes so that we can deal with traffic? And you need the lanes because you know, autonomous cars and human-driven cars don't mix. It's cattle, cattle and sheep right now, meaning the human-driven cars are the danger. Uh, and so, so there's all this forward thinking that's already happening, and then you come to Uber and so on. And meanwhile, you know, there's a lot of technical challenges to actually make sure that a car stays on the road, right? Right, and um, I don't think they've even come close to working out those technical challenges, but uh, for example, how does a car that's uh, uh, driving along autonomously get off the road if it's blocked in by two other lanes that are human drivers? I think the fun part is when uh, two autonomous cars dis discover the same parking spot at the same time. Now, <laughs> now you need uh, you know, psychological conflict management uh, software. And uh, no, th there's, there's a lot of, of questions. And actually, um, I love the theme of autonomous driving because it is such a visual representation of everything the entire high-tech industry, the economics around it are doing of where we're heading, right? But many of the benefits of autonomous driving are long before it's autonomous. I talked to a, a key exec from uh, one of the uh, automotive uh, companies, and I cannot vouch that what he told me was exactly correct, but he asked me the question, you know, insurance, car insurances, what's the biggest piece of the insurance cost? What do you think? Is it, you know, killing people on the highway? Or, you know? The answer turns out it is backing out of a parking spot. You back out, ka-chunk, four grand of damage on, on, on both rubber bumpers that are full of electronics and can only be replaced. And so we all see this happening, and we all know that this is completely avoidable with modern technology, right? And so those are benefits on the way to autonomous driving that have potentially massive economic impact long before the long-term uh, vision materializes itself. But the long-term vision is well on its way. Having uh, had the opportunity to, to drive uh, with an auto, uh, autonomous car on the highway, I can tell you that was at high speed and there were some moments where it was interesting. And it, so- It's a white knuckle drive, isn't it? I'm sorry? It's a white knuckle drive. It was interesting how at some point in time the test driver just innocuously grabbed the steering wheel and, and thought I hadn't noticed. I did notice. So 
in the past, what we've built a lot of hardware. Um, software came in, and everybody predicted that we'd have generic hardware, and um, all the software would have the functionality. We seem to be shifting back. We seem to be going, it's not that the software is, is any less relevant, but it's not necessarily the only thing that's going to determine a system because, first of all, it, it, it uh, takes a performance hit. It uh, is much less efficient in terms of power, uh, but software is very good in terms of defining how that hardware is going to be used. How does that change the dynamics? Do we have enough software engineers, first of all, to even, or hardware engineers to even make this work? And second, what, what happens on the relationship? You guys are now heavily involved in software. Well, you know, it, it's interesting the way you formulated it because it reminded me of the Makimoto wave in semiconductors, which was sort of this back and forth between generalization and specialization. Uh, and invariably, it's always driven by the same thing. The specialization is if you can get at least some temporary differentiation in something that's relevant, such as uh, you know, performance or low power. And then you try generalization because then the economics are more uh, leveraged. Well, we're absolutely going through a, a phase like that right now because the, I think there will be specialization in computation for uh, all the, these algorithms. I don't think there's any shortage whatsoever of, uh, of software engineers, maybe in the areas that are now hot uh, because you know, hot and cold changes pretty quickly and uh, as much as there's an enormous amount of excitement about machine learning, it, it has all the characteristics, it's bubbling, and so it has all the characteristics also of a bubble, which is a lot of investments, some of which will go nowhere. But the sum of these investments is really an indication of the dynamism of the, uh, of the industry and, and the phase of research. Now, in our industry, I think you know, we are mostly software engineers with a lot of you know, physical understanding. So it, you know, we've gone through, uh, from the, the, the six PhD deep engineers, of which we have many, to now needing more and more six PhD wide engineers that understand the relationship between multiple domains. That's another way of saying that, that uh, in our field, we've moved from the Moore's Law scale complexity to systemic complexity. And to me, that's super interesting because that is leverage on the very skill set that the EDA industry or the IP industry has. Do the tools that exist today, are they, they geared toward that kind of um, understanding systemic complexity and the kind of systemic complexity we're going to be uh, dealing with in the future? Yeah, I, you know, I think that, that uh, one of the, the, the credits that the EDA industry deserves is that we've moved from a relatively simple understanding of a chip as in functionality and area, and area was always important because of the yields, to, to then uh, pretty swiftly add uh, performance to that and then power consumption and our reliability and, and increasingly so various forms of security for let's say automotive domain or other. And, and these are all additional dimensions. So, so the, the notion of systemic complexity has already been in existence in our field for a long time. But as you said in, in your preamble, it, it's been very deterministic algorithms or linear thinking. And now uh, systemic complexity is finding a whole new realm, which is what if you just had oodles of data coming from all kinds of sources? Can you find additional correlations that essentially permit uh, predictive uh, analytics? And once you have that, predict, predict, the word prediction is always of high value because by definition that's a differentiator. The challenges that um, we're now dealing with um, very specific types of markets and the tools that we have are fairly expensive. So you're, you're putting in- High uh, value, yes. High very value. high value and the, the solutions will be high value but the rewards have typically not been high value for those markets. So if you run, run a chip that is, is specific and includes all the software, do you get paid for that? Well, you know, I'm absolutely not in the camp of ever complaining how well our industry is doing. Now, uh, we've been fortunate, of course, as a company, but, but so have many others. Uh, uh, and, and if you look at the EDA industry in aggregate, it, it has grown better than the semiconductor industry, which we serve. Uh, and you know, th th there's no right and wrong of that, but I don't think, I, you know, I, I like the term techonomics. We are the essence of techonomics. If, if we could provide way more value, there would be more money. Uh, for it, our customers are constantly you know, fighting for li their livelihood by driving their differentiation, their cost base, uh, the economics of yield. And together, you know, for literally 50 years or so, we've absolutely kept up with this delivery of high capabilities. 
I think it is true that, that the industry now is broadening in terms of, of the number of skill sets. And the one word you've not bring up, uh, brought up yet is IoT, which of course uh, you know, is, is a new uh, both tech-onomically advantageous, meaning there's new technologies, the economics are, are right on, uh, connected to physics. And so now physics is coming in uh, through massive amounts of, of data stream into this picture. And, and with that new uh, uh, oil, some call it, uh, one should be able to do something useful. That is a broadening of the perspective of what we have touched. That is quite substantial. All right, let's, let's talk about IoT while we're at it, and IIoT as, as well. Um, how do you develop chips for these markets that are, we don't understand, first of all, how they're going to be connected, where the processing needs to be done, whether it's being done at the, the, the sensor level, whether it's being done at the edge of that uh, network, or whether it's being done up in the cloud. We have not created architectures that, that run that, that seamlessly, and can the tools that are around today even understand all those different pieces? So I'll be more positive. I think we know the answers to all of these things. We're not quite precise about some of that. No, we under, know the answer very well because it, it's the same answers of do you need local computation or do you need a mainframe? Uh, you know, how much of, of, of your computation is done in the cloud versus how much do you do at your, at your desk? What do you deal with the display and so on? And the same is true for IOTs, meaning that uh, you can generate an enormous amount of data. The, uh, the, uh, the pathway of the data limits uh, how much you pass to some other computational entity. And then there's some additional questions, which is, you know, if you don't have reliability to your pathway of data, then you need computation locally. And the car is a perfect example. If you rely on the car computation to be on the cloud, you have no chance of having a safe uh, and secure car, of course, right? But that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of computation that uh, can be done and provided to a car uh, coming from, let's say, the car that has just passed the corner and knows around the corner there's a dog on the street. Well, that information is theoretically available and could either be transferred from the previous car to the next one or via some other source. And a lot of people are working on that. And so the, the, the mathematics of, of computation versus transfer of data are well understood. The, the rate of change is so high and the rate of new opportunity is so high that, of course, each individual case makes it, makes it difficult to answer. And actually, uh, I've been um, sort of trying a little game in, in, in some of the, you know, the dinner speeches I give, asking the, you know, the audience to exactly answer sort of your question, which is, if you look five years from now and you say, how much, soft, how much silicon is used in the cloud versus how much is used on the edge? And, I, and I'll, I'll take out memory because we know there's going to be a lot of memory in the cloud for sure. But take that out. How much silicon it needs? And then I give them a choice of 1,000 to 1 in the edge, 100 to 1, 10 to 1, 1 to 1, and then switching it 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to 1,000. Where do you think, and then ask people to vote, right? Where do you think is the center of gravity? I don't know. I'm usually the one asking the questions. But, oh, that's right. But, I forgot. But, 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 so, uh, but I'm sort of wondering if we now should start investing. This is, in building, up, this is building up the tension for okay. the answer. Anyway, so, but the, the answer is interesting. It looks like two Gaussians. And I don't know yet if that's because that's really the reality or because the people answering answer by virtue of where they're working. Right? And so if you're in the IoT part, you think, hey, you know, it's going to be maybe not that big a silicon, but it's going to be a lot of them. If you're in the cloud, you know, there's going to be a lot anyway. My, my point is more, I think, all these individual cases will ultimately settle on tech-onomic needs, meaning what is technically necessary and what is the most economical way to balance this. And our industries are unbelievably adept at figuring that out very quickly including by making a bunch of mistakes. Right? It's a good time to invest in sand. Sand, silicon, it's all the same. So um, let's swap topics here. One of the big issues that we, we wrestle with all the time these days is security. Uh, I think everybody has had at least one of their credit cards breached. Uh, I keep getting letters from all the uh, hotel chains that I co go to that uh, everybody on the world now knows my social security number. Um, how do we solve this problem? There, there's no easy how do we solve it answer. For, for starters, you know, 
it's yet another technical problem in many ways, except that there's a big difference. Uh, you know, this technical problem has massive intelligence behind it to make it worse. You know, when we dealt for the first time with, you know, uh, cross capacitance, there were no, no guys that said, let's make it really worse and, uh, you know, keep you alive uh, and, and busy. No, at some point in time, you nailed the physical problem. This is different, right? They are e equally good people on the other side, uh, some for, for just fun reasons, all the way to uh, you know, uh, criminal reasons, all the way to extremely uh, disruptive uh, people uh, that are actively working on this. So, so the problem will continue to evolve. W what is clear, though, is that remedial action is completely insufficient. We, we will need to go much more towards uh, uh, security, and I'll, I'll put safety in the same general space because the automotive industry is suddenly reacting to this. Uh, we need to be increasingly correct by construction on everything we already know. And, and, and I'm careful with these words because we keep learning about new issues. Um, you know, as you probably know, uh, we have invested now uh, for a few years in the whole notion of quality and security of software. And uh, literally, uh, just a few weeks or so, published uh, some research of how much uh, open software that is old is in existing products. And the percentage, and old means you know, more than three or four years. Mm -hmm. And wh what that means is, uh, the reason this is relevant is because there are now repositories of uh, known issues, security issues with open software. And of course, open software is very powerful and very useful, extremely leveraged. But if you have open software in your product and you don't know that since then a bunch of uh, vulnerabilities were discovered, the product is vulnerable, which begs the question, of course, well, are you responsible? Well, if it's a car, sort of, right? If, if it's some gizmo that can be thrown away, probably less so. But, but nonetheless, the, the life cycle is impacted by the past. And uh, I don't think that remedial solutions are sufficient, therefore, uh, correct by construction or, or very proactive, designing security in is, is going to be a necessity. And I think it applies as much to the hardware as the software. But the software, of course, is, is the main uh, set of more vulnerabilities today. Well, there's a crossover here between not only um, security and safety, but also reliability over time. So yes. if your system yes. breaks down, if you update it with something that's potentially um, bad code, you can affect both of those. So we have to start building this in up front on a lot of these systems, right? Do yeah. we have the tools and the know-how in order to do that? Well, you know, f for starters, this, this brings us straight back to, I think, what, what is still the, the most visually uh, uh, complete and appealing example of the whole digital uh, age is, is, of course, the autonomous car. Because the car industry has actually, in my opinion, an unbelievable uh, pedigree of dealing with safety and therefore partially also is reliability because the safety is not when you send, sell the car, it is over the lifetime of the car. And a, as you probably know, there, there are many uh, uh, standards that have been developed to try to orchestrate uh, a methodology that, that is more redundant, that is self-diagnosing uh, of issues, and in general uh, guarantees a certain degree of safety that's much higher than if you didn't do that. Well, the automotive industry has discovered when the Jeep was hacked, which is about a year and a half or so ago, that, well, you know, the weakest link is the software of which, you know, an advanced car has, uh, you know, 100 million lines of code. Uh, and, and it's all pretty much connected to everything else. And, and the hacking situations we've seen have been quite amazing in their creativity, right? And so, so here's an industry that has banked on, on safety as a cornerstone of its existence where software, which is this great promising opportunity for cars, is at the same time the single biggest danger zone for, for maintaining that pedigree. Those are, that is why it's chaos and opportunity at the same time. We tend to think of uh, security holes at the seams of technologies, right? So it's where the pieces go together yes. that you have the vulnerabilities. How do you close those up and how do you close those up for the future? So this, this goes back to the reliability. If, if something breaks down, it potentially can cause a um, security hole, it can cause a uh, uh, safety issue, but it also, um, we're working with car companies that are look, now looking at seven nanometer chips. There's no history for this stuff. How do we know that these are going to be reliable? 
Well, it's a great question because this, this is one of the outcomes of going from scale complexity to systemic complexity because systemic typically means that you rely on, on expertise and experience from very different groups of people or companies uh, or disciplines. And uh, by definition, when you put to things together, the things tend to have been under more control because they're designed by a group that takes responsibility for it whereas the putting together is designed by a third group that may not have six PhD deep on each of the subgroups, but now needs the six PhD wide precisely to figure out where the intersections may be vulnerable. And by definition, intersections are a simplification of the physical reality of any uh, system. And so th the modeling of that is going to be increasingly super important. Well, that immediately leads, of course, to the intersection of hardware and software. Uh, and one of the, the opportunities that the EDA field is facing right now is that, in my opinion, the center of gravity of delivering value has moved to this intersection of hardware and software, which is interesting because that means skill sets on both sides can multiply each other. But I always say, you know, uh, in English you use the, 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 the term that success is the sum of our effort. It's not. It's the product. A single zero and everybody gets zero. And, and, and the more you have systemic complexity, the more you have multiple teams, multiple uh, actors, and so you count on, on now on every one of them being uh, successful. And so uh, systemic collaboration is actually at the heart of the success model going forward for these type of issues. Can we use the tooling that exists today for things like debugging for security, uh, verification for security? Yes, there, there, there are more and more capabilities that, that will be applied in that area. And in all fairness, you know, the, the, the silicon space has had a fairly high degree of diligence on verification for the simple reason that, you know, you wouldn't dream uh, of sending something to manufacturing if it hadn't been vetted pretty thoroughly because, you know, the cost of a mask set is substantial. In software, uh, not in all fields, but in some fields, the penalties have been a lot lighter. You know, if something doesn't work, you send out a patch, and if that doesn't quite work or it creates a new problem, send out another patch. And all of us get, are getting patches all the time. You can easily see that if in both in, in the scale of the software going exponential, in the systemic nature of the software being multiplicative, we are facing more and more issues that are not solvable uh, that way. And so uh, some of the, the, the rigorous techniques coming from hardware verification will gradually find more, more application in software as well. When I look out at the industry, I see a continuum in terms of, yes, we have gotten these capabilities to start from where you were coming from with the PC all the way to the mobility and then into the, the IoT. The flip side of that, though, is it becomes a lot harder to develop these chips. The, um, there's a lot more influences, there's a lot more interactions than we ever dealt with in the past. What is a what is the semiconductor industry, and actually, what does the EDA and IP, IP industries look like going out several years? How do they change? Well, in many ways, uh, you know, the conceptual changes are, are, are continuations, right? We, we keep driving the notion of integration as uh, the most tech-onomic effective way of balancing the need for, uh, for high data rate uh, exchanges with, with a cost base that is manageable through the, uh, the cost base of silicon. <clears throat> there are a number of situations where that becomes more difficult. And it's <clears throat> especially if you start interacting with, with the, the reality of physics, you know, the sensor technology tends to uh, prefer different silicon capabilities than the advanced uh, <clears throat> logic computation or, or storage. But even there, there are advances that are trying to bring these things continually together. Whenever that's not possible, you get other forms of integration. And of course, the oldest of those is, is a PCB board. But if you look at PCB boards, you can see a continuation of shrinking those to, uh, to, to silicon interposer, to a variety of mechanisms, maybe potentially stacking uh, chips. And they all have great opportunities, but, but precisely the same fragility that you alluded to when you have breaks between domains. All right, and so it sounds great, hey, uh, why don't we stack some chips on top of each other, except you really hope there's no, not one of those in the middle that is really a, a thermal uh, generator because the, the other chips may not be designed for that. Well, it would be very compact, but it brings up all the thermal questions. And, and how do you deal with that? And so we could say, well, that's hard, or you can say, no, wonderful for our industry because the benefits of doing it well 
uh, are highly leveraged if we can solve some of those, those issues. But the natural way of balancing between them is literally techonomics. What technology is, is sufficient to solve something and what are the economics governing uh, its benefits? And we have some new um, techniques that are available that really haven't been used in the past, right? Like silicon photonics is now starting to gain a lot of interest. We can potentially add in a bunch of new things that we never played around with before. A lot of this was developed, but it, it never really made it into um, uh, c the mass market because either the uh, what was there was good enough and cheap enough or because um, that wasn't uh, developed enough so that we could get there. What else do you see coming? Well, but, but uh, let's just agree <coughs> stick with the example that you uh, just used because uh, you know, uh, photonics have, of course, been very useful in a number of applications where super high speed was a requirement and the solution was good enough for it. Well, you can see these solutions expanding right now because if you look at, uh, at the major compute centers, uh, distance actually is starting to really matter for a lot of problems. And by the time you, you, know, you populate these things with just enormous amounts uh, of data, and of course you like to data to be as close proximity as possible to computation and vice versa, you start seeing people putting more uh, memory straight on the chips, but you're also going to see uh, you know, photonics playing uh, a role in the vicinity of those, essentially to accelerate whatever is the weakest link. And, and, and in many ways, you know, another way to describe our industry is the nonstop focus on whatever is the, we the weakest link. You know, and the weakest link can be just a, a bug in your software, it could be a really deep uh, technology issue that, that yesterday w was immaterial. And you know, uh, for, for a long time I've been mulling about this notion of, of what creates discontinuities. A and discontinuities at the technical level or maybe uh, at the economic level is where one exponential crosses another. You know, you have two exponentials and they're fighting and, and the top exponential just gets all attention, right? And then the other ones sort of get closer and who cares, who cares? And then one day they cross and overnight, the new exponential gets completely all the attention for good reason, because the difference between exponential is exp exponential too. And I think we are going to see, and we are seeing continuously exactly the same happening in, in not only the technologies that we are so close to and that we drive. We drive exponentials. I don't know of any industry that for such a long time has been so capable of driving exponentials. That's unbelievable. But it's now happening to the economics around our field. That's why it feels like such an exciting time. It's also happening at a time when it's getting harder to scale. So we're, we're finding, yes, I agree with you, Moore's laws could, could, can be continued. There's a lot of pieces in place to continue it all the way down to one nanometer. The problem is it's taking longer. It's getting harder to do that. It's taking um, more effort. Uh, and it's also becoming a lot more expensive as you go. So. But no, oh, let me st you sound like a fuddy-duddy now, right? I mean, I mean, with all respect of being a good friend, actually. No, we, we all sound like that because we all remember that it used to be so easy to scale. It was never easy bec because we are always running at the same speed, which is maximum. Our cars, we take super glue and we glue the accelerator to the floor. That is our field. That is, it's always been our field and it's always been harder and always gonna be not, uh, not possible anymore and Moore's Law is dead and so on. I, I, buy, I buy the fact conceptually what you say, of course, but, but I refuse to adopt it as a psychology of our field. We, we, we see in front of us from a silicon plus technology, 20 years, we see it in front of us. Yes, the economic returns change, but the capabilities are still being delivered. But multiply that with now the next layers on top of that, such as the software layer, such as the closer proximity to all kinds of physics. We are in a fabulous position again. We're going to drive this. Hard. That's actually I was not getting, young people. I, I was not really getting pessimistic. What I was saying is there are many ways to solve this problem. It's not necessarily the same way forward. However, it's coming at a time when we have all these new market opportunities, so we have lots of I ideas and lots of ways to solve the these problems and many new applications of them. What happens across the industry? So we go back to a couple years ago, it looked like the industry was going to be all synopsis. Now uh, there's a lot more companies. We have new, new startups coming into EDA. 
How does the industry look and, and how does it start sh reshaping itself? Trading rules does not allow me to respond exactly to your question. Yeah, that's what I figured. No, the, 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 the reshaping is constant. It, it is constant and has, actually I don't think it has all that much to do with individual companies. Of course, some companies at the right moment may be better placed than others. That, that's always been true. But it's also always been true that uh, the people that are most comfortable and confident in their position uh, get passed by, by people that may not have the same history but are super creative. I, I think the, the nature of our industry is one of constant rapid evolution. And evolution is sort of, you know, a dying just enough so that you can be reborn with some new ideas. And uh, I think that happens uh, throughout our industry. It, uh, it happens now a lot around our industry. You know, you look at the semiconductor. So many people have said, oh, look at what's been happening in the last uh, few years. Semiconductor maturing, it's slowing down. You see all the M&A. Yes, maybe it's maturing, but I think it's not maturation, it's rejuvenation. And if you look at the type of, of, of M&A, you see, you see uh, first financial M&A. So put stuff together, cut out all the overhead and you know, be more efficient. More interesting is horizontal uh, uh, M&A where people that sort of do the same thing suddenly create critical mass for new investments to go faster. And now what we're seeing is vertical M&A, which is trying to go af get closer to the application space where actually the money comes into the system and then drive the technology to be particularly effective in those spaces, so automotive or health or computation or wh whatever uh, it is. What does that do to R&D, though? Does it raise it as a cost, as percentage of uh, uh, revenue? You know, I think it is hard to raise it more than where we are because our industry is, is a bit over 30%, which is arguably among the highest, highest. You know, there may be some drug research companies that, that at least temporarily do even more than that. But it is, it's hard to see how you can support real companies that do have real uh, channels, real support organizations, uh, with a lot more investment than 30 uh, percent. Now, the other way to invest in R&D, of course, is to also do acquisitions, which is just an, a different pathway to bringing creativity and technology in. But uh, I, I wouldn't say no. I think I think if the opportunities were there, you know, I'm certainly in the camp of invest more if we can. Well, invest um, acquisitions in this industry is sort of like fishing in the Grand Banks. There's pretty much overfished at this point, right? There's always other rivers. Uh, okay. Well, I think we're out of time, but Art, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thanks, Ed.